Hello, my name is Jack Kenny, and today I'm going to discuss clocking and equalization for high-speed serial links. We're first going to discuss serial links, the essence of which is getting bits between two ICs. Uh, we, we'll next describe what an eye diagram is because much of the terminology in the subsequent talk will involve eye diagrams. We'll go into clocking uh, in serial links. I'll give an example of linear equalization and then we'll have a summary. So the essence of serial links is, is a bit-to-bit -bit transfer of data between flip-flops on different ICs. The goal is to transmit the most bits using the fewest pins at the lowest power and to get them all across that link correctly. Currently, data converters have serial links that operate at 12.5 gigabit per second. Emerging standards will head towards 32 gigabit per second, and with some coding efficiencies, the goal is to get rid of about two-thirds of the wire. So now let's move on to a little technical content. So first, let's start with the concept of an eye diagram. An eye diagram, the concept is you overlap multiple periods of a longer waveform. So here you see this yellow trace, and then we overlap it with the green trace, and we end up with a waveform that looks like an eye. So there's some important terminology that we have. First off, a UI is a unit interval. It's a bit period. So when you're sending data at 10 gigabit per second, one UI is equal to 100 picoseconds. You also have your vertical eye opening. That's the peak-to-peak -peak voltage in the center of the eye. You have your horizontal eye opening, which is either measured in UI or it's measured in uh, picoseconds. The point at which you sample, which we'll see, is where these come together in this cross here. That's your sampling in both voltage and time. So next, let's move on to the idea of clocking. So traditionally, in data converter applications, we had clock-forwarded links. So in the transmitter, you have, the clock, you have a clock source, which I show here, a clock multiplier unit. It applies a transmit clock to a serializer. So a serializer does an n bit to one bit conversion. So you can imagine we're sending 12 and a half gigabit per data between the transmitter and the receiver. On the receiver, we have some programmable phase shifter, and that provides a receive clock to a deserializer. The deserializer does a one bit to n bit parallel word conversion. And internally, you can think there's a flip flop here. So now what happens is that the, uh, the transmit launches data on the rising edge of the transmit clock, and the flip-flop within the deserializer samples on its rising edge. And what you want to do is you want to have this nominally positioned in the, in the center of the eye so you'll have equal setup and hold times. In this way, if there's any movement or jitter on the clock, that gives you immunity and gives you a better chance of recovering that data correctly. One of the advantages of clock forwarding is that if there's jitter on the transmit clock, it will appear on the data edge. So you can see here the, in this, the entire eye shifted. But since the receive clock is just a delayed version of the transmit clock, the receive clock moves in, in unison and the system works well. Well, not all systems provision for a forward clock because that means additional wires and power. And so what do you do in, in that circumstance when you're not getting the clock from the transmitter to the receiver? Well, in that case, we introduced the concept of clock and data recovery, which was otherwise known as a CDR. So in a CDR on the receive chip, you have a clock multiplier unit. You have a CDR, which is basically a delay lock loop with a phase detector and integrator and that phase shifter from the previous slide. And that CDR will figure out the timing to position the receive clock in the center of the data eye. Now, um, there are a couple of things that happen. You did have different clock sources at the transmitter receiver, so that, that property of the correlated jitter no longer applies, so therefore the CDR has to capture the fact that the transmit data has shifted in time. Uh, and in addition, these systems tend to be higher power. You can see right off the bat that I have a clock multiplier on the receiver as well as the transmitter. And if you look at under the hood of the CDR, you'll see that your number of flip-flops essentially doubles. Okay, so now we're moving on to the last topic, which is the topic of the equalization. So your wires have some frequency-dependent loss, some, which I show in this characterization. 
And in serial links, we provision a three-tap FIR on the transmitter and a continuous time linear equalizer on the receiver to compensate for those losses. So here, uh, here is your typical channel. Our wires are modeled as a lossy two port. You can think of VTX as being the output of the transmit flip-flop. VRX is headed towards a flip-flop in the receiver. So this, the channel has a source impedance RS and a load impedance RL, which are nominally, which should be equal to each other. In the case of wireline lengths, these are single-ended, they're 50 ohms. Differentially, they're 100 ohms. So the concept of insertion loss is, uh, insertion loss represents how much power is applied at the input and gets to the output. So it, it, it's an indication of how much loss we have going through the channel. And so the idea to equalization is the equalization should have its gain where the channel has its attenuation such that when you take the product of these two, you end up with flat gain out to Nyquist where Nyquist is half your bit rate. Now in this case, you can see that beyond Nyquist, we have a gain of zero dB. So the in-band gain of this arrangement is in fact, in fact equal to the insertion loss. So you can see that end to end, the combination of the channel and the equalizer attenuates the signal. So the consequence of this is now that you have some frequency loss throughout the channel, your, your pulse is spread across multiple samples. And so in this particular case, I have two plus ones is zero and two more plus ones. And you can imagine that if the tail from this leading bit sort of strays into the adjacent bit, then we no longer go to that full negative value. The consequence of this is that if you take a look, the eye has, you can see that edge is shifted and your voltage levels have compressed as well. Your eye has shrunk and that gives you less immunity to either voltage noise or clock jitter. So this is, a, this is not the, a, a less useful waveform to recover. So next we're going to discuss the equalization strategies. So here uh, on the transmitter, we have a three tap FIR. The cursor is your main tap. It multiplies the bit AFK. It has your highest value. You have a precursor tap, AFK plus one, and you have a post cursor tap, AFK minus one. Uh, this, is, this is just doing a summation. So on the bottom, we see the difference equation associated with this transmit FIR. The advantage of putting the FIR on the transmitter is that delays are flip-flops. If you were to put this at the end of the link, the same equalizer, you would now have a signal rich in analog voltage, and you would have to start implementing either track and holds or analog delay lines, and the system becomes quite a bit more complicated. So on the receiver, we also have an equalizer. We have a continuous time linear equalizer. And now remember, with the insertion loss, everything is being shrunk to lower voltages. So we have a limiting amp. Uh, the, limit, the idea of the limiting amp is, let's say you have 50 millivolts coming out of your continuous time linear equalizer. Your limit, limiting amp boosts it to full swings, such like 600 millivolts peak to peak differential. In that case, the flip-flop can very easily recover the data at that point. So the idea to this continuous time linear equalizer, it has a programmable zero. Uh, and so therefore, if you need more boost, you push the zero to a lower frequency. And you can see again, what we're doing is we're attenuating low frequencies and at, at, above, um, at about 10, 10 gigahertz in this sample, everything goes to the same gain. So let's finish up with, one, with an example. So here we have an example of a channel with minus 14 and a half dB of insertion loss. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just use strictly transmit FIR. So I have a precursor and a post cursor, which are both minus 0.15. And then I have my cursor multiplying AFK by 0.7. These values are complete, conveniently chosen to give this nice expression for a Fourier transform at the bottom. So let's plug in a couple of frequencies. So a frequency of zero, well, if you evaluate the cosine of zero, it's one. So if you go 0.7 minus 0.3, you get a gain of 0.4 here. 
And then if you go to Nyquist, well, Nyquist is half the bit period. So if you put, if you substitute that into the expression, you're taking the cosine of pi. Well, now you have 0.7 plus 0.3. That gives you a gain of 1. So what you've done here is you've attenuated DC relative to Nyquist by minus ATB. So here's an example. On the left, we have no transmit FIR whatsoever. You can see the peak-to-peak -peak swing is 580 millivolts. Uh, the vertical eye opening is on the order of about 80 to 90 millivolts. With that transmit FIR from the previous page, you can see now that the peak-to-peak, -peak, the vertical eye opening is 210 millivolts. The horizontal eye opening is 73 picoseconds. This is for 12 and a half gig, so that's 73 picoseconds out of 80. But you can also see that now the peak-to-peak -peak voltage is about 280 millivolts. So, so we have attenuated the signal to, to something smaller going into the limiting amp. So where does this all fall apart? On the left, we show an eye where the transmit filter has been optimized, but it's running at 25 gigabits per second. Uh, what happens here is that now, as you take a look at this, the inner eye opening is down to 30 millivolts because all we've been doing is attenuating. Eventually, if you put too much uh, de-emphasis or continued attenuation in your CTLE, you push your signal into the, in the, into the noise floor of the limiting amp and then bit errors occur. So in summary, we start off by discussing the essence of serial links. I showed a couple of examples for clocking. I described insertion loss, showed an example of equalization where we did it strictly in the transmitter. Uh, and the consequence we showed in the last slide at 25 gigabit per second is that at some point the limiting the, the, the linear equalizer will fail and we'll be heading towards strategies like architectures such as decision feedback equalization. So here is on the left is your DFEs, your, uh, your equalized. That's your future. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge some of my colleagues at Analog Devices, in particular Hassan Gaid, who did these graphs that I showed for the eye opening. So thank you.